Good Friday morning here on the Cross Border Interview Podcast. Uh, my name is Christopher Brown, as always, and we are back with our December edition of our Community Spotlight. Like in November, we are going to start looking at the community organizations and community groups here in the city of Calgary and start shining a spotlight on them. I'm relatively new to the city, so I'm trying to learn about this great city and all their great organizations, and today is no exception. Today we have the communications manager for the Alex, Johanna Schwartz, on the show. Johanna, thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. Thanks for having me, Chris. So uh, I guess I guess we have to start with a big question. What is the Alex? <laughs> that is the big question. The Alex is a uh, multidisciplinary wraparound organization that really understands that you are not healthy if you are hungry, if you are socially disconnected, if you're experiencing homelessness or mental health issues or addiction. So we are a community health center that's been in the Calgary since 1973. And we take what we call a wraparound approach to healthcare, uh, which means that you might come to see a family doctor at one of our clinics, but you may also leave with a hot meal, a connection to counseling, a chance to have a conversation with a peer navigator, some support with some justice issues you might have, or some sexual health products or some more clothes. So we kind of do it all under the banner of uh, dignified, um, judgment-free care for everybody. It seems like a big task. And let's 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 start because I don't want to get into COVID-19 till a little bit later, but how wh why was it founded? Why was there a need for a, a program that is a wraparound approach to healthcare? Because uh, it seems like we live in the greatest country in the world and the great city and a great province, but it seems like people are still falling through the cracks. Why was the Alex founded? That's a really great question. Um, back in the 1970s, the idea of a community health center really was kind of sweeping across the country. Um, there are a lot of community health centers in Ontario is something that really took off in that province and um, didn't make its way as far, I think, um, into the Western, you know, Western provinces, like it has established itself in the East. But the idea of a community health center truly is the idea of what healthcare should be for everybody. And people do ask that question, you know, we live in a great place with, we have, you know, we have universal healthcare, there's a walk-in clinic on every corner. What do you need a health center like this for? And really it is for folks who have much more than just one issue, one visit, healthcare concerns. People with complexities that are generally um, due to, um, you know, systemic issues like poverty, racism, intergenerational trauma, you know, and all of the things that come out of that, like addiction and mental health needs, and just um, the, the needs to have someone where you can have a deeper, longer conversation about the issues that matter uh, and recognize that they're all interconnected with each other. So as you and I may go into the doctor because we've got a sore throat or just because, you know, we have, you know, a thing that we need to do, um, for folks where their kind of their physical health is a, is a barometer of the rest of their experience and their, and their, their quality of life, a community health center uses the kind of health as an entry point and then provides the rest. So there are lots of people that do fall through the cracks because our system really isn't set up to handle complex issues. They're very uh, departmentalized and people get bounced around. And something like the Alex does, um, what we hear over and over again is when you can get almost everything you need taken care of in one space, you don't have to tell that story over again. You don't have to re-traumatize yourself. You don't have to continuously prove your need and your worth. Um, and doing it in sort of a one-stop shop is a much nicer way for people to experience and, and, and feel like they have um, a home uh, where someone will listen to them. What I found fascinating, so prior to the uh, interviews, I try not to do a lot of research because I, I want to learn from you because you are the people who are promoting the organization that you are. But I do do some research because if I didn't, I would be coming up with the great questions. What I found interesting about the Alex is on your website, it says that you have, and I'm quoting here, 10,000 annual walkthroughs a year. Mm -hmm. That is a lot of uh, like people coming into an organization. You talk about the complexity of some issues. 10,000 seems like a lot that you have to work through and help. 
how, how are you guys doing this? <laughs> That's a great question. Well, we have a staff of over 400, so that helps. It's a large organization. Um, and um, those, that 10,000 people, that are um, that's people who come to our youth health center. Um, so those are youth age 12 to 24 who might be street connected um, or need that extra support. That's the thousands of youth that we see when I take our dental bus to elementary schools and uh, connect with, uh, with low income children right in their schools and help them with uh, dental care. Um, that's the 500 people we house through our housing programs um, each year. Um, and it's thousands of meals that we serve at our community food center. So there's a lot of different points of entry. So it's not like we have 10,000 people all coming into one same building and okay. accessing the same program. We have so many different programs across the space. It also includes the thousands of people that this year we've housed in our um, self-isolation site, which is one of our COVID, uh, COVID response programs that hopefully won't be uh, continuing on for too much longer. But yeah, it is, it is a complex organization staffed with you know, hundreds of people, um, psychiatrists, doctors, nurse practitioners, case managers, social workers, addiction specialists, um, you know, and a huge support team that make it all happen. You, you talked about low income for dental health for children. You talked about uh, housing, uh, housing some people, isolation for COVID-19. Um, I'm going to ask a pointed question here, and I apologize if it comes off the wrong way, but is your organization focused on low income earners or is it for everyone? Mm. That's a really good question because it actually does depend. Um, for a lot of folks, um, the income barrier is something that challenges them and it is a priority for us. But there's other people that we would consider, you know, for lack of a better word, marginalized or vulnerable, or it might not be an income issue. It could be, um, you know, LGBTQ youth who comes from a very comfortable family, but is having a challenge having a conversation with their parents. Um, so, you know, there, it could be, um, you know, anyone honestly with uh, an addiction issue that is ready to start um, a medically prescribed plan today could walk into our rapid access addiction medicine program, regardless of income level, and get that help. But what we do find, again, are these system connections, right? So generally, folks who are also experiencing low income are also experiencing food insecurity. They're, so they're coming to our food center. They're also ex, you know, um, experiencing other poor health uh, measurements. Uh, so tend, they tend to be interconnected, but they are not necessarily always correlated. And we are very, very we pride ourselves in being barrier-free, as barrier-free as possible, which means we're not requiring what they call means testing to access our programs. So you don't have to show how much money you make. You don't have to be on H or Alberta Works necessarily to get to our programs. We prioritize for that, but it's not a, it's not a, a you know, a pay to play kind of scenario where, you know, you have to be uh, at a certain level to get, to get programs from us. Is it an intake service or is it a referral process? Because I think there's a lot of people who might go, uh, I, I might need resources to help me with potential dental yeah. or mental health, but I'm not sure if I have to go to my doc, my family doctor first to get referred to the Alex. How does the process, the intake process work? Because I think there's a lot of confusion around that and a lot of confusion around what services potentially you could walk in to get. Another great question. Uh, we have, and it varies. Um, what we, again, back to being barrier free, um, some programs do have a wait list currently. Some programs, um, but most of them are, you can self refer, that is the general scope. Um, you can walk into the Alex any day that we are open, Monday to Friday, uh, and just talk with uh, the first person you'll meet is a peer support worker. Who is somebody who has lived experience, who has been, so if you don't have an appointment and you're just there to be curious, there will be someone to have a conversation with who can then connect you with what might be the appropriate channels for you. Um, our community food center meals are just walk in at any time, you know, that we're serving our lunches and our dinners. Um, for our youth, particularly for our youth, um, it is an open door policy. Um, and that is how we find most of our youth come to us is that they've just, a friend has said, hey, go to the Alex, you gotta talk to them. You, you know, you need to deal with whatever you're dealing with. You just show up there one day. And that is exactly how folks come in to us. Um, the only program that's really specifically different is our housing program, because that is part of a collective agency citywide response. 
So we all, as any housing program, have um, a, 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 a funnel that you have to go through through a program called Source to get onto the application form and into the process. Um, but otherwise, practically every other program that we have, barring um, you know an aged range, you know that you have to be, um, is open to everybody. That seems like a lot to do. You talk about your 400, uh, 400 uh, members who make up the Alex, and that's great. But there is unique issues that face Calgarians on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and I, I ask this question in a weird way, but is there a point when you can't do it and you have to refer to somebody else? Or is it a one-stop shop? So if someone comes in and it's not a program that you offer or a service that you offer, you say, we will help you find the service that you need. Because yet again, it's a very tough world out there. And as much as your organization is great, you can't solve everyone's issues. We can't solve everyone's issues and, you know, we shouldn't be doing things that other people are doing really, really well. I think that's the other part of it too, right? Especially in the charitable sector. Yeah. Um, uh, and I think people do need to, you know, understand that, um, you know, good organizations that are really thoughtful about the way that they are, um, they are, you know, they're spending um, public money and, and they're, you know, that trust that we have is, is a lot of it is also finding gaps and filling gaps as opposed to duplicating services. So, so absolutely we have, you know, we always pride ourselves in what we consider like a, a warm transfer from somebody from us to somewhere else. So if there's something particularly an area of expertise um, like Momentum is a great or, great example of that. Momentum is, a, is an organization that provides like financial literacy training uh, and really helps people with money saving, kind of job training and things like that. So they'll come and do some programs with us, but we often will send people there um, to do some of those very specific things. And um, yeah, to be honest, that's, that's a huge part of like system navigation is a huge part of the work that we do uh, because it is very, very complicated. And, you know, I often think about the challenges, like as a, you know, single mother, like what it takes for me to even remember to like register my kids for soccer or do, you know, really basic life skilled stuff that to me just gets away from me. I cannot imagine trying to do those sorts of things while also worrying about keeping my lights on or having food in the fridge or, you know, or trying to find enough bus fare to get to an appointment. So when we have the ability to kind of help and scope all of that out for somebody, um, get them, help them fill out their applications, help them get identification, you know, all those barriers to care. Um, we spend a lot of time doing that work um, and then recognizing the great partnerships we have across the city and making sure and, and following up too. Once somebody leaves and they you know, it's not just the end of it all. We usually check in and make sure that they actually got what they needed from the other from the other group as well. That's awesome. It takes a system, you know, it takes a whole city to to really like make it happen. It takes a village, right? It takes a village to raise mm -hmm. a child. So I can imagine yeah, exactly. that, uh, especially during COVID nineteen, it takes many villages to raise a family mm -hmm. and help a family. Um, before we talk about COVID-19, I want to talk about two of the programs on your website that I found quite interesting, and I just want to talk a little bit, a little bit about them, and that is the, I want to make sure, the Youth Health Bus and mm -hmm. the Community Health Bus. Mm -hmm. So what is the difference between the two? And I just want to, like, let's start there before we, we'll dive into both of them. So what is the difference? Like, can a youth not walk up to the community health bus and vice versa? Like, it just seems very, like, duplicating of services, but I could be wrong. <laughs> so the community health bus is the granddaddy of our mobile fleet. It's been on the road for 20 years. Um, and that really started, I'll give you a bit of history about it because it makes it into kind of an interesting story. So it really started as, again, that like gap filling. How do we get to folks who are falling through the cracks? Um, how do we get to folks who are really only accessing the system when they're in crisis mode, which we also know is the most expensive way to use, you know, our, our system set up. So the community bus is a fully functioning doctor's office on wheels. We have a nurse, we have a doctor. We usually have like a client resource specialist who usually doubles as the bus driver. We can hand out non-opioid just prescription drugs on the bus. We can do blood testing on the bus, STI testing, uh, all, all range of services. And we started driving that bus just literally around downtown, parking it under a bridge, kind of hanging out in areas we knew where people might uh, need um, assistance and just 
idling there and waiting for folks to come on board. Um, that worked for really well for a long time and got to the point where other agencies asked us if we could basically bring that service to them. So we will go to um, shelter systems, we will go to other agencies where their community um, has a medical need, but the challenges again of accessing that are, are myriad. So the bus shows up, pulls up and people can make an appointment or they just walk in. And so now the bus um, is, um, specific to the folks who are there and part of the program where, that we're visiting. So it's not as much of a walk-in, just okay. kind of general public thing, because that, beca that became really hard to manage. Um, so it's better for us now to work with an agency because they already have the history of the folks. They know who, you know, they know who they are. They can follow up and know and we have a bit more of a better connection. Now, the youth bus was the next kind of step in that piece. And what it is, is a partnership with the Calgary Board of Education. So the bus specifically goes to high schools that um, that the CBE has determined in need. And they range across the city because really there's at, you know, at risk youth at every, in every high school and every demographic and every financial situation. Again, it's not always just about being low income. It could be about a hundred other things. Um, and that bus again, pulls up to a school um, at a certain time. It's like there every Monday, you know, um, afternoon, you can just text to come on board. You're not marked absent from class. You don't need a note from your parents and you can come on board and have the same conversation. So it's a similar service function functionally uh, with a slightly different focus and different demographic. And the people on the youth bus are specialized in youth mental health and, and youth uh, physical health. Um, the community bus now actually is also going to a few high schools as well because it has such a great uh, demand that you know we can't physically be in more than one place at the same time. So our community bus is now actually doing some supplemental youth um, high school experiences too. So the okay. idea of the mobile the mobile structure um, is that you know there's no better way to say you know the right care in the right place at the right time than showing where kids are at and where people are at. You talked about the community health bus being around for 20 years now. Have Has the uh, Alex seen an increase in usage of it over the last 20 years? Because uh, many people might not realize that there is a uh, hidden population in the city and we don't often see it. So we don't often know if it's actually being, if a Pro, a program like the community health bus, bus is being used. So has it been increased because you are taking your services to where the hidden community the population is? It absolutely has. And it's been really um, a critical piece, I think, in the overall growth of our programs as well, uh, because it's a connector, right? So we'll meet somebody on the bus. Uh, that might be the first time they've had an interaction with the Alex. Uh, what we, all, we hear a lot about is just that they were met with a smile and how huge that is for somebody. And after that point, they want to stay in the Alex family and, and connect back to our, our regular clinic as well. So it's been, uh, it's been a steady um, purpose-driven program that has really led to increased um, connection to people to have a family doctor. We have people who have had the same doctor at the Alex for over 20 years. We have doctors who've been working here for over 20 years. Um, so there's a lot of history there. Um, you know, and for some people, it's, you know, some people, the Alex is a transition in their life. And for some people, it is really their kind of their, their medical home for ever. And that's absolutely okay. Wow. Um, yeah. you, you talked about how the community health bus was more of a center, uh, downtown centric when it first started. Has it expanded? Like, would I see it out here in the Northeast? Would I see it up in the Northwest? Do you go to where the population is or do you hope the population comes to you? Or how does that work? Because I just want to, I, I, I just, I've never seen it up here in the Northeast, but I've never been openly looking for it until I now know about it. <laughs> So now that we were mostly focusing on going to um, partnered programs, so we'll go to like the Reset Center or we'll go to um, uh, the Mustard Seed does have a secondary shelter that's I think in the Manchester Yard sort of area, so into the Southeast. Uh, we go to Susina Nation as well. We go to the reserve um, and uh, are continuing to build more connections that way. We've also just started um, a relationship with TELUS with a new little sprinter van that is going to be doing mostly like um, basically our rapid access addiction medicine program, like outreach for particularly for addiction um, in a much smaller space that will be easier to navigate 
downside of driving an RV around downtown or around the city is that you're driving an RV around and you know our uh, our bus drivers are are incredible at their ability to park and, and <laughs> rotate but there are areas that we actually can't physically get the bus into um, so uh, but it is a continuing the, the mobile units are a continuing um, presence uh, and they are a very visual a lot of people do know us from that because they are driving they'll see them on the street as they're moving around but they do mostly park so they'll go on a Monday and they're here for the whole day so you're not they're not bouncing around various different locations through the day they stay in one space so that this there's again consistency is super important for people to know that that, that they're going to be there that day so they show up is there a count cal- like I know this might sound like a stupid question for people who are listening but I'm going to ask I, I like asking the stupid questions from time to time yeah. but is there a calendar because if someone's like I, I feel like I'm not going to be able to make it down to downtown to go to the Alex maybe they're they might be up here in the northwest uh is there a calendar that can people access and go okay they're going to be up here so I, I know that I should be looking out on Tuesday next week for them Fair enough. The, right now, there is not be just because the uh, the places that we're going are already organized with the other agency, so they're not just open to the general public. They're open oh, okay. to the the community at Reset or the community at the Must Seat or the community at the Drop In Center. So those folks will know. Um, and when we that is the dream though is to get to the place um, where we are doing more of that. We were over prior to COVID going to uh, like the Genesis Center. We would actually just park the bus outside of the Genesis Center and also Bebo. So we were doing some more generic kind of outreach that way and our dental bus was doing that as well. So we would just like pull up and then that you could pop on. Um, but we uh, we need to basically get, make sure that we're at the right, or that we're filling the right capacity. But that's the dream, honestly, is to get to exactly that stage. Looking to get your message out? Looking to get your product heard about? Have an upcoming event in the province of Alberta. For as low as $50 per week, you can now advertise on the Cross Border Interview Podcast. Reach out today by visiting www.crossborderinterviews.ca and click on Advertise Now. If you book your advertisement during the month of December, you will get 50% off. Now, let's get back to the episode. So I want to jump back for a few seconds because you mentioned something about the bus going to the First Nations communities around us as well. Um, I should have asked this beforehand, but it didn't pop into my head until you just mentioned that. But are your services available for people outside of the city like Airdrie, Chestermere, Okotoks, or is it specifically for the people of Calgary? It is not geographically specific. Um, if people are willing to come to the Alex from Airdrie or Okotoks, and we do, we do have folks who live outside. We have we have people who live in Canmore, Cochrane, who come to the organization. Um, we've talked about expanding ourselves out into um, not only into other maybe areas of Calgary, but other areas in southern Alberta as a dream for us to get to that voice point. But yes, our our um, criteria is not about having a Calgary address. Thank you for answering that greatly. Appreciate it. Um, let's let's talk about COVID nineteen. Sure. COVID nineteen has ravaged our sort of day to day lives, and a lot more people are struggling. Has the Alex seen a increase in usage over the last? I want to try and do my math here. Mm-hmm. Twenty months. Yeah. Yeah, we have. We have a lot, um, particularly um, in some of the kind of easier, low kind of access um, places like our community food center in Forest Lawn, which is a space that provides like delicious farm to table food and organic produce and the opportunity to learn how to cook and uh, take nutrition classes. Um, uh, we saw over 800 new people walk through the doors last year. Um, and we doubled the amount of meals that we had uh, previously been uh, doing. We would do a three, prior to COVID, three meals a week, like a breakfast, lunch, and a dinner that people could walk in. Um, for the first, probably first eight, eight to 10 months of COVID, we kind of pivoted that to a um, pick up, take out. So people could come up and basically say, I'm a family of six. And we would say, okay, here's two macaroni and cheeses and a, and a chili and a, here's a bag of apples, you know, and we would have, this would all be food we would have made ourselves. 
that we'd have frozen and they could take it home and heat it and eat it. Um, so we saw a huge, huge increase in that. And I think that's really a testament to how, the, you know, the, the, the razor thin wire that people are sometimes living on, particularly when it comes to things like access to food um, and how quickly you can tip to the other side uh, with that. Um, and then we've seen that, you know, what we're, what we're really anticipating right now is to kind of catch up with folks, particularly with their mental health. Um, you know, as people are kind of coming back, um, we spent a lot of time reaching out to people um, to ensure that they were safe. Um, but we're really anticipating um, those kind of long-term effects of, that, that this has had, increasing our need um, in terms of our mental health supports too. You talked about how, uh, and this was probably in the first five, 10 minutes of this uh, interview so far, um, you talked about how uh, the Alex had to sort of change a service that they provided and offer isolation services for people who mm -hmm. might not be able to do that. Is that the only, is that the only services that you had to sort of adapt to the global pandemic or was there other things that you had to do because um there's a lot of people struggling like you said mental health mm -hmm. is a big issue uh people not being able to find a place where they can isolate when they might have COVID 19. are there other services that you had to introduce into your organization to adapt to the global pandemic Yes, um, at the very beginning, basically, we took every um, kind of social team member, so anyone who wasn't a, like a frontline medical professional, and brought them all together to basically do um, an outreach uh, program just to call everyone we could get a hold of. How are you doing? Do you have access to a smartphone? Can we see you by computer? Do you need a laptop? Do you need a phone? Uh, what can we do to make sure you're staying connected? Um, so that was a huge uh, shift brought everyone from across our programs together, which was really exciting um, and to show that we could really do that kind of work when needed to be done. Um, then we um, also started doing vaccinations. So that was another huge part of it. We uh, worked with AHS, became a you know, qualified organization that could, that could vaccinate our own population uh, and our own community and have been working really uh, diligently on um, not only getting vaccinations done, but the education for people that might be hesitant about it or, or, or concerned. Uh, we just did our thousandth vaccine last week, which is a great milestone for our, for, our, uh, for our community as well. Also recognizing that's another thing that's like, it's hard to be, you know, it's hard to just show up at the TELUS Convention Center and stand in line or go to a pharmacy, um, you know, if there's like stigma, um, you know, or, you know, other issues that might be hard for, hard for you to do, anxiety or other things. That's difficult. So being able to provide that in a safe space people already knew and loved, you know, was was a great addition to that too. So this is airing, this episode's airing on December 10th, 15 days prior to Christmas. Is the Christmas time harder or does it does the Alex get more use in the Christmas time? Because we talk about mental health during COVID-19, but mm -hmm. there is usually an underlying mental health potential crisis when it comes to the new year when it comes to christmas where people are struggling people aren't able to afford food it's a challenging time and i think a lot of people don't realize that um does does the alex offer programs for people during the christmas the season the winter holidays the christmas break like what programs do you offer and you can tell us and my listeners that you offer to people who might be struggling and might be looking for a glimmer of hope during this Christmas mm -hmm. break? I mean, social isolation is a challenge in the best of times. You know, the last couple of years, it's been harder and the holidays make just add another layer to that. Um, what we, you know, in, in the past, you know, we've had big full like open hall turkey dinners, you know, those sorts of things. Um, obviously, it's looking a little bit different the last couple of years, but yes, um, there isn't. There is a, um, you know, a real effort on our end to provide a little bit of warmth and comfort at this time of year. That's you know that might not all, always be available. Uh, we have an incredible program um, that's happening again this winter called the Holiday Hope Totes Program, where we're asking people to donate, you know, um, you know, comfort items, hygiene items treats um, that we can then put in. We did over a thousand of those last year and we're hoping to do the same again this year to get those into the hands of folks. 
Um, our community food center is teaching, and this is open to anybody, teaching winter or kind of holiday um, recipes. Um, or um, we're doing, um, like, I think we just had one about like the holiday food of Vietnam, um, you know, different kind of cultures, uh, particularly in the, the regions and the neighborhoods uh, around Forest Lawn of the different folks who live there. Uh, and when you sign up for those classes, you actually get like the kit, like you get like all the ingredients, you just take them home and then we work together over online and, you know, practice cooking together. Um, and then for our housing folks who are really like the Alex is their home. Uh, we always have a special opportunity to have a meal, to have gifts, you know, and, and to connect with folks. Uh, but yeah, the tote program is a huge part of that as well to be able to provide you know, just um, a little something, a little extra warmth and something that, you know, people care, gift cards, so people can go and, and buy something for themselves too, or for their kids, you know. Uh, we asked for like a $25 gift card, which doesn't seem like a lot, but is a huge amount of money. Um, and, the, you know, and just also just give the, um, the dignity of choice to people as well. It's, it's, it's really, uh, you know, an important thing to do as well. Financial donations have probably been harder to come by during this global pandemic because there's a lot more people struggling. Um, how has that affected the Alex? Because I, I don't want to say you operate fully on charitable donations because I'm assuming you do get funding from the provincial government, the federal government, the city of Calgary as well. But those that extra that you might get from financial donations might affect some services that you might be able to provide. How has that affected the Alex? And you're absolutely right. Those, um, the, the financial support that we need from the community um, is what um, floats all of our social programs. We are um, supported on our medical side from Alberta Health and through our housing programs, through um, different and, and, you know, and federal channels, but all of those sort of soft services that they were, those human connection pieces, like the addiction programming, the counseling, the food, the, uh, you know, all of those bits and pieces um, are all fundraised annually. And, um, and we have definitely seen a challenge. The, the first year of COVID felt actually pretty good. Uh, people were very willing to just sort of like, you know, existing um, existing partnerships that we already had that were maybe about a social program, we were able to like change and move and spend on things like PPE instead, you know, a lot of those other costs that we hadn't budgeted for that ended up being, I think for a lot of organizations, particularly one of a healthcare organization of our size, very, very expensive. Um, and I think there was a lot of great energy at the beginning of COVID to just help in any way we can, but people are seeing the, the longer term effects of this now, and it really has had an impact for us. Um, financially, we are launching a, a giving campaign that will, is active now um, at give.thealex.ca, and it's a way for us to spread the word across the city about the work that we're doing, um, and hope that people understand um, that um, all of the work that we do all adds up to a healthy, healthy community, and that everybody has a, a role. Basically, I I joke that if there's some if there's something that you care about in the city that you want to see changed. As long as it's not pets or the trees, we've got it covered. <laughs> if you care about poverty or, or food insecurity or homelessness or addiction or mental health or youth or seniors, um, you know, a donation to the Alex is a donation that changes how that is in your community uh, because we do cover so many things. Uh, I will link that link down in the show notes for anyone who's watching who wants to potentially give even $25, like uh, Johanna said, it does go a far distance and it might not seem like a lot to you, but it does help people through this tough times. Um, we are at the end of 2021. 2020, 20, 2022, wow, if I can speak properly today, 2022 is a new year. Hopefully the pandemic is under control. People are getting their vaccination shots. What does 2022 have in store for the Alex? Oh, if everything you just said is true, it's hugs. <laughs> like we cannot <laughs> wait to like <laughs> to see our people again in a really meaningful way. Um, some really exciting things. I mentioned the new um, the new van that's going to be addiction, you know, medicine kind of out to the community. Um, that's that's coming down the pipe. We're really working on focusing on what we call social upfront, which is the idea that 
uh, when you walk into the organization, uh, you were met with that peer support counselor, you're met with social team. Because um, what we did find was a lot of people come for a doctor's appointment, but really what they're doing is they're spending their time having conversations about housing, about mental health, about food, you know, all these other things. Um, so we figure if we can kind of find a way to, to triage that a bit better and have that happen um, outside of the doctor's office and that frees up our physicians to do more and we can see more patients as well. So, so that's something we're really growing. Um, I think like many organizations over the last couple of years, we're very much focusing on our, um, our kind of our indigenous ways of healing and recognizing a space to continue to create better, um, better experiences for, um, for the indigenous uh, folks who come to the Alex. Uh, we've been working on developing a beautiful, um, we have a beautiful gathering space now in our building uh, where we'll have the opportunity for people to meet with elders, and have smudging and all sorts of other kind of activities, um, which is another thing we're very, very excited about. And then just in general, yes, opening our programming back up again, having those drop-in spaces, like if we can get back to that activity that we've had in the past, if we can have our kids come and gather for book club in person, then and work on their art together uh if we can take do yoga classes again like oh my gosh like we just can't wait to be back to that energy the sky's the limit in 2022 it sounds like that's the plan <laughs> um before my last question for you johanna joanna is this what should the people of calgary and the surrounding area and the people who are listening to this uh show right now know about the Alex that isn't as well known as it should be. What is the one thing that you, you the misconception, the, the unknown fact about the Alex that you would love people to know about? I think it's really the scope of what we do. Because when I talk to people, they often have a single point of entry. They think, oh, I know you from the buses or I, my daughter, you know, you go to our school or, you know, I had a, a dental checkup. I think that that full understanding how many people we are helping and in how many different ways we are, you know, providing a new pathway for people to walk. And they are the ones who do the walking, you know, we're just there to walk alongside them. Um, and to know that, you know, as an organization, we're really trying to be part of the solution and not an additional element of the problem, you know, and really, um, I think are doing, I, I truly think incredible work in just providing what you would consider to be like dignified, trauma informed, um, judgment free care, so that people come, they come to us, and then they come back to us. You know, and I think that's one of the challenges in our system. We have an incredible group of organizations and there's a lot that are doing great things. But I think when the system is a, is a collective beast as a whole, it's very cold and very scary and very challenging to navigate. Um, so I feel like the Alex is a beacon in that community of just a, a warm and welcoming place where you might not even know what you need. You might not know how to get it. You might not know what's available to you, but if you show up, we will let you know and we'll help you out. So, you know, if people have a teenager who's struggling with mental health, if they've got a trans youth, they feel like needs a better um, medical place to get support. If they have a, you know, a family friend who's suffering from, you know, addiction, um, anyone has an opportunity to be part of the Alex family. Um, and I think we all recognize that we can see the Alex community in our own community as well, because we're all Calgarians, we're all in, we're all in this together. Could not have said it better myself, Johanna. Um, I want to thank you. I want to thank you for chatting today, uh, talking about your organization. I think I have a better understanding of what your organization and the complexity that your organization does on a day-to-day -day basis now. Um, I hope my listeners do as well. For those who are listening, uh, the link to the Alex is in the show notes, as long with the fundraising uh, give the Alex.com. Uh, it's in the show notes as well. So please check them out. Please look into the organizations that make up this great city like the Alex. Uh, Joanna, thank you so much for doing this. This is an honor and a pleasure.
Well, I really appreciate the opportunity. Thank you for spotlighting us and the other organizations and for showing that kind of great deep curiosity about what's going on in your city. Um, I think that's really uh, infectious. I appreciate that. <laughs> No problem. Uh, for everyone who's listening, uh, this has been another great episode of the Cross Border Interview Podcast. Uh, if you haven't already, hit the subscribe button on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you're listening to this, on YouTube if you're watching this. And also, uh, uh, enjoy yourself. Have yourself an excellent weekend. Uh, we will be back Monday with another, with actually the last week of shows for 2021. So please tune in next week for another great uh, week of shows. And I just want to let you know, uh, Joanna, that this is our hundredth episode of the season. So you are the hundredth episode of season three of the cross border interview podcast. Uh, I, I want to thank you so much for doing that. I should have mentioned that at the top of the moment, but it just clicked into me that this is the hundredth episode. So thank you for being part of history for season three. <laughs> Oh my gosh, I'm so excited. That's awesome. <laughs> there you go. Uh, everyone have yourself an excellent rest of your Friday. And uh, as always, keep talking. Talk to you later, guys.